stand by the rod of the apostolic i move you forward moving to your destiny the first thing that the prayer that engenders dominion produces is access to the voice of god if god is not speaking into your life you'll be in trouble it is by prayer that divine purposes are born when a man who dominates by prayer is praying one of the things that he catches from the realm is the voice of Yahweh. the reason is because dominion moving to your destiny moving to prophecy in the name of jesus your hands toward heaven. Because if you received an answer it would have been the judgment because in that realm is is legalistic you are dealing with immortal creatures and the things that are uttered in that realm they are locked up in scrolls and until a scroll is open you don't have the right to speak because your words in that realm are not only for communication you can say something and it can become a, a word because there's a realm where words are for creation and so when you are talking in that world, you may think you are communicating. You are not communicating. Nobody is interested in listening. Every word there is for creation. That's the realm God stood in Genesis 1 when he said, let there be light. He wasn't talking to anybody. He was creating. The energy level in that realm is such that every utterance is pregnant. And so if you talk there, it, you will be judged. And so when we begin to do business in deep waters, sometimes we chant because we are careful. There are realms when you show up and you ask a question and before they answer you, they check your stature in the spirit. You know, the question Mary answered that Gabriel responded to was the same question Zacharias answered, asked and he was made dumb. Question is the same but stature is different because at your level, you shouldn't ask questions. You know, when we want to talk kingdom, it's a, it's a, it's a strange realm. It's a strange Lift your hands one more time. Let's try again. Yeah. Hallelujah. mighty on your throne you reign you ancient Zion's king Kadosh Kadosh you are mighty on your throne you reign you reign you reign give you glory we honor you Lord we humble ourselves before you tonight and we ask that you speak to us strengthen our spirit and cause us to receive 
of realities that are immortal. Help us to handle these realities and to pass it to the next generation without corruption. Thank you, precious Father. We love you. We give you praise. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. <laughs> Do you know why? You know why I stopped? Sorry, but please be sensitive. Do you know where I stopped? I saw a light falling on this side of the wall. Please be. And that light came with mysteries. And God said, There's his cry. There's his cry that he wants to ordain. This ones we write things that generations after we read. Don't clap, don't clap. God is anointing somebody. It's a light. It came from heaven. Because immortal scrolls are about to be open. We don't speak because we read. We speak because we are witnesses. And so when the river begins to flow, sometimes even the minister needs to stop. Because the utterance may be with somebody in the, in the audience. There's a river being stared. There's a cry. Bring the person for me. People who will write things that generations after we read. And they will not just write messages. They will write the destiny of nations. And they can tell you the things that will happen 50 years later. And come rain, come shine. Those things must happen. This is how you preserve the heritage of a nation. Because when it is captured in prophecy, no matter what happens, no government can uproot it. Because those are utterances from the realm eternal. Holy Ghost for one minute. You reign, you reign, you reign. You are the Zion. Shadow, shadow. You are mighty on your throne. Break forth, O fountains of the deep. Cry out, God, oh, you are mighty on your truth. Bread for O oh, Spirit of the deep. Cry out, God, oh, you are mighty on your truth. You and nations because there's about to be diversification in the spirit. Ushers, you will help me now. The first three people that God touches now, I saw seven arrows being shot out of this place. Capacities have been enlarged. Now I speak as a priest and as I come 
in the spirit of Elijah, I provoke an activation. Marakoape etekavaya. Melonia, Farak, Tatatali, Zuzane, Mante Kabaya. Warriors, seven hours, be sure. Bring the first trip for me quickly. It's a violent anointing. Give you glory. Bring that person to me. Touch.
you, O Father. Just allow them, allow them under the cloud. Allow them. Just allow them. When they are rested, they will find their way. So we can manage time. Bring the Bible. Let's attempt again. You will never remain the same again. Some of you will live here and you will step into angelic encounters. You will enter places and you will come as a heavenly entourage. Angels will escort you. The powers of the ages to come. Men that can wield those powers. They arise from among you. Thank you, Father. If you can't be seated for a moment, maybe we should begin from the book of Psalms. Psalm 102, verse 16. He said, For the Lord shall build up Zion, and then he shall appear in his glory. The Lord shall build up Zion. And then he shall appear in his glory. In the realm of the spirit, what spirits do is to build civilizations. The reason is because in the context of a civilization, their glory can be revealed. Without a functional civilization, the glory of a spirit will be shrouded. And so every time a spirit wants to do the business of glory, he begins to build. And God is the originator of this reality. And so when you find God moving, it's because he wants to build again. The reason is because most times when God builds, what he does is that he raises functionaries because his kingdom is a kingdom of kings and kings. And so the only way the functionaries that exist in his kingdom can participate in the economy of the divine is to give them the opportunity to experience what rulership is. And so what God does is that when he builds a civilization, he allows those functionaries to partake of it. But most times, these functionaries fail to understand that the authority that was bequeathed them was bequeathed them as a means for expressing and administering the glory. In the course of advancing that civilization, only God should be seen. Yes, the moment God becomes obscured, that civilization is no longer necessary. You know, when the first earth was created, a prince was summoned to rule over the earth. He said in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the same story. It's a reality that began from eternity past. And it will continue even at the end of this one. Because the Bible spoke of the new Jerusalem appearing from heaven. God is building. The only time God will start building is when his glory is allowed to find expression. And so when he created the first earth, the Bible said that earth was judged. He said the earth was found in the state of chaos because God judged it. And the reason God judged it is because the prince that was allowed to bring administration to that world, decided to go the way of rebellion. He no longer administered the glory correctly because the glory should not come to you. The glory should go to God. The moment the glory begins to come to you, that civilization is invalid because God can no longer be seen. You know, the Bible said he shall appear in his glory. That means when the glory is directed to him, then he can be seen. But the moment the glory is torn from God, they will see you, they won't see God. And so God can no longer appear. And when God no longer appears, that civilization becomes useless. And so what God does is that he begins to build again. And so after the first civilization was judged and God created the next civilization, he allowed Adam to rule it. But Adam didn't understand the business of immortals. The ancient prince came in the guise of a serpent. And he took, you know, when, when you find inventors, there is what they call a pattern that gives them the right, the exclusive right to administer that invention. So the authority God gave to Adam 
was the power to seclude the earth from those princes. But Adam did not know that there were other princes like him in the realm of God. You know, when Paul came and Paul was giving access into mysteries, the corridors of light, Paul began to tell us, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. There's an ancient battle going on. Princes have been at war from time immemorial. He said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. So there are princes that are looking for territories to dominate. And if you understand the sequence of their oppression, a principality is the first prince that shows up. And what the principality wants to do is to secure legitimacy for the other princes to come because all princes are interested in is civilization because they are in the business of glory. Before they fell, they knew the glory. The Bible spoke of Lucifer, the son of the morning. He said he moved to and fro in the midst of the coals of fire. He did business in the first Eden before the second Eden was downloaded. He knew the ways of glory. The Bible said thy taps and thy tablets were indeed from the day of thy creation. So the job of this being was to coordinate worship in the Zions, the realms of Zion. So he knows the, the emotions of God. When God is being worshipped, he knows what to do. So, because they understand the glory, only glory satisfies them. And so when, when the principalities are sent, they are trying to seize the civilization. And when they hijack a civilization, they take over the civilization. It becomes their possession. And they create citizens that will follow after their, their kind, their desires and their nature. And so Paul began to give us insight that this world you are walking in is not about buying a car. In the realm of reality, they don't need cars. You need car because you are falling. If you like, buy a Lamborghini. It's a state of the fall. When an angel looks at you, he's laughing. Because he can go to heaven and come back before you drive out of your compound. There, yeah, they travel at the frequency of thought. An angel can go to Nigeria and come back now in less than a second. So, when you say you are flying a private jet, jet a G450, you say this one, I bought it for $30 million. The angel is looking at you. Before the engine of the plane warms to get into the cloud, the angel have gone beyond the air realm and come back and is looking at you. What are you doing? You are falling. You need a meta to, to float in a meta and feel important. That you are wearing it, it means you are falling. What they are interested in is glory. And because you are falling, they can trade your soul with a car. It shows you how cheap, how cheap mortals are. Mortals. They are cheap in the scale of balances. They can bargain your soul with 10 million pounds. And then you sell it and you are walking with a big wristwatch and a phone. You say you have arrived. <laughs> That's why when sons come, they fight for civilization. They want to take the system because they want to insist that the glory of this world must become the glory of our God and of his Christ. That's the burden of sons. When a son comes into the United Kingdom, he's thinking of how to take over the systems so that they, in the house of commons, they can come in the morning and say, Jesus is Lord. His goal is not to be called a member of parliament. No, that's not his body. That title is too mundane because in Zion, he's a prophet. In Zion, he's an apostle. In Zion, he's a prince. You don't need to give him a title in the house of commons for him to feel important. But when he goes to the house of commons, he wants the name of Jesus to be glorified. And that's why he's going there. Because the business is the business of glory. So that God can be seen. God is obscured from our world. And so when God gave the earth to man, he threw it away. Because he didn't know the importance. He was chasing apples. He was interested in momentary gratification. I want to talk to you about the weapons. The weapons of an ambassador. The weapons. The weapons, there are, there are ammunitions that we carry in the spirit. Weapons. That's what makes us who we are. 
And so when you look at an ambassador, he doesn't need a car to validate himself. Then he has authority in realms yonder. When, when Pilate saw Jesus, he said, I have the power to, to release you. Jesus looked at him. You have power. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. You don't know me. When the army came to arrest him, they brought a legion. He said, you bring soldiers to arrest me. I was in the temple with you all day. And Peter took a knife. He said, no, don't fight. We have better weapons. I can ask my father now. And he will deploy 12 legions. 12 legions. Do you know, do you know the number of a legion? A legion. I don't have time to enter certain things. We will, we will be lost. He will deploy 12 legions of angels. Now, meanwhile, when you study the scripture, in Isaiah 37, one angel walked through the camp. One. In one night. Not in one year. He walked through the camp because there was a hidden king that came to defy the army of God. In fact, he said, have you not heard of my fame? The nations I went to, they trembled. Their God couldn't save them. And when Hezekiah was trembled, he said, don't cry. One arrow will not be thrown in this nation. We don't need to fight with weapons. And one angel walked through the camp and 185,000 soldiers were slain in one night. Meanwhile, Jesus said, if I ask the Father, he will deploy 12 legions. If one angel slays 185,000, if 12 legion come, meanwhile, what Jesus was referencing there is a, is a weapon. It's called intimacy. He didn't say, I will pray to God. He said, I will pray to the Father. There is relationship. <laughs> it's intimacy. Those are the riches of intimacy. That's why when we say pray, you think prayer is about give me admission, give me bread. No, prayer is a journey. There, there is a place you get to in intimacy that God whispers into your ears. He whispers. At that level, what you need is not a car. You can change the fortune of the economy with one word. That's the power Jesus was invoking. They are called the weapons of an ambassador. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. Civilizations, civilizations. I'm saying all of this to let you know why God is moving. Because I told you, when God is moving, it's because he wants to build. When the first earth was destroyed, he said darkness was upon the face of the deep. Genesis 1 verse 2. And he said the spirit of God hovered upon the face of the deep. And God said, light appear. When God is moving, he is building. And so when we are talking revival, is because an edifice has collapsed and God is building again. <laughs> I spoke in parables. You know, when you start the job of building Zion, a point will come where fame will come, power will come, influence will come. If you are not careful, you will leave Zion and start building Babel. And so the reason God is building again is because what we have now is no longer Zion, it's Babel. So the revival we are talking about on one side is judgment. On another side is a building project going on. And before God builds a civilization, he will build the men. This is why I'm speaking about the weapons of ambassadors. If you want to feel feature in this civilization God is building, there are badges that you will carry. You will possess those badges in the spirit. Those badges are the things that will determine your rank in the world that is to come. Because church is not a place of excitement. It's called the ecclesia. That's where laws come out from. He said, out of Zion proceed the law. And so the people who are in church are men who understand how to wield scepters. We know the game of authority. We know the game of laws. We know the foundation of civilization. We know the powers of utterance because we have been tampered with by the Holy Spirit. We are not an exciting people. Sometimes we shout. But even when we are shouting, I told you, it's not out of excitement. We want to collapse Jericho. <laughs> Everything we do in Zion has a purpose. 
that is deeper than the moment. A man without understanding can interpret it based on the moment. But when a man of understanding shows up, he will know the reason people are these guys are carrying flags. It's not because they want to appear in a strange way. It's because they are taking over nations. <laughs> they know. When, when wise men come, they look deep. They look deep. <laughs> it's deeper. So you, you I, I turned, I saw the flag of Israel. I told, I said, these are, these are wise men. Because nations are born on the earth. They are, they are not born in the parliament. The parliament is where it's concluded. But it's as soon as Zion travails that she brings forth her children. <laughs> and so some of you here, you may be 14 years old, but you are a nation builder. Because when you are on the altar, those three hours of groaning, what you are adding to the foundation of the nation may be righteousness. That's your own part. And maybe the nation God is building. Righteousness is the foundation. And so when they start, you are praying for five hours. We are now you are an architecture you are putting righteousness there and somebody else may be putting the fear of the Lord the fear and so when it comes to pray you find him lying on the floor crying and you are wondering why is your prayer always tears and travail it is because of the kind of block I am introducing you may be introducing righteousness I am introducing the fear of the Lord and so the angel that is building with you he will not allow you pray until you weep. Others may come and pray in capital letter tongues. You, when you want to pray, you start groaning. When you want to pray, you start crying. And then you are wondering, why can't I pray in tongues? Your impute in that civilization is the fear of God. And every time men fear God, they are broken. And so the angel that is building with you, we insist that you are broken before you can pray. And so you can come, you will not find out trance. The worship is going on when you have wept for 40 minutes. That's when you can say, Aya, kaka. Aya. Aya. Your prayer is finished. You are a builder. God is building Zion. So that his glory can appear. Because what we are seeing now is Babel. When you show up in church, it's show. It's titles. It's connection. It's vanity. And so, how can God appear? The men have become too bogus. And so they have blocked every vent that should pipe out the Holy Spirit. Human and bishop are the biggest blocks in the church. The bishop wants to save money for his great-grandchildren. Meanwhile, what he doesn't know is that the business is not a business of money. It's a business of the glory. And it's a transaction of souls. And so he left glory and is attending to money. The apostles knew it. They say it's no need for us to give ourselves to tables. No, no, no. That's not our assignment. And so when Zion is lost and Babel replaces Zion, God will build again. And the men that God will approve of, they have badges. And these are some of the badges I want to share with you tonight. I pray that God will help us. Because I'm also in the process. Don't assume that this is one ancient man coming to I may be in class one. God just showed it so that we can share it and run with it. You know, when they wanted to defeat, Jehoshaphat wanted to defeat Ammon, Mount Seir, and Moab. The person who prophesied was also part of Israel. When he finished prophesying, all of them were going to the battlefield. <laughs> you get? So don't assume that God has finished with this man. I may be, some of you may be my senior in the process. But God just asked me to say it so that we can find the blueprint and know the things that matter. Because they are badges. They are badges. I will start with the first one. The first badge.
And so in 1 John chapter 5, from verse 11 to verse 13, the Bible began to tell us, because the original builder is Christ, but Christ needs to be extended into you because Christ will need your vocal cord. When Christ wants to build by talking, he will need somebody. When Christ wants to build by giving, he will need somebody. And the only way he will be sure that the integrity of the building will remain intact is to vet it with his life. And so he said, the life is in the sun. And he said, whoever has the sun has life. But the moment this life enters you, it's not just to give you food. The moment the life enters you, it becomes a law in your soul. And so when Paul wanted to build the house of God, he discovered that there was crisis in his members. And he came to a point, he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of corruption? He discovered that he was already trained by another system. He discovered the orientation he had was different from the orientation of heaven. And he was trying to please God with his strength because he was a scholar. He read law. And he was trained by the best. He was an orator. When he speaks, it's like a God is talking. And he thought his oratory will, will be part of what God was using. But you see, in the economy of life, your natural advantage becomes your greatest disadvantage. Wow. Wow. You may come to church and you are an orator. And when God looks at you, he discovers that there is high-mindedness in you. And that high-mindedness will make you corrupt the beauty. So what he will do is that even though you are the best speaker, he will tell you to go and be the usher. Stand at the door and welcome people. Because life will insist that everything that is alien is a quality control system in the spirit. Everything that is alien to God, life will fight it. And until that thing is destroyed, you can't participate. You may quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. God is not looking for scripture quotas. Because the scripture, the scripture came from heaven. He's not looking for those who will impress him with scriptures. He's looking for those that can reflect his image. And so when life comes, life comes with a governing system. Your oratory will be put aside for seven years. And God will make sure he deals with the high-mindedness. Some is covetousness. God will look at it. He won't say anything. In fact, you can even go and create a blog for yourself on Instagram. You will post things there for four years. Nobody will look at it. Your uncle can be a senator or a mayor. And he will, he will give you a slot on the national television. The day you come to sing, nobody will tune in. And you will be asking all your friends, did you hear me yesterday? They say, sorry, I slept off. The government of life will make sure that everything you do is frustrated until God tames the flesh. This is what Paul discovered. And so when he discovered that, this is not about natural ability, he rested in the Holy Ghost. And he said in Romans chapter 8 verse 2, he said the law. Now this is not just a reality, this is now a law. Because it will insist, laws don't bend. If you jump now, you will come down. He said the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus, that law has set me free from the law of sin and death. That means what makes you function the way you were function, functioning is not about what you read. It's about the other law that was at work in you. And that law is called the law of death. And so when God wants to give you a badge among those who will participate in the world that is to come, he will turn your eyes away from your charisma. Because the energy you require is not in the flesh. He will turn you into the government of life. And when life comes, life will break you. Ah, life will break you. You will fight, but it will break you. That is the only kind of prayer God does not answer. You can cry all night. His ears will be deaf. Because what he's doing is that he's breaking and forming. He's breaking and forming. Because until you attain the specification, you will become an alien in Zion. The reason you find the building is not because of the shapes of the blocks. It's because of the chiseling of the architect. And so there are certain blocks that their shape becomes a cancer. So they will cut it off. It's only half that can enter the building. Because when God is building, there are different dimensions. He will look at you and discover, oh, you talk too much. It's not a sin, but it's a weight. And so life will come. And the way God will do it is that he will open up a technology in your spirit. I was sharing with God's servant earlier. 
You know, when you enter into life, the first thing you find is the joy of the Holy Ghost. You are excited about God. The joy overwhelms you. Nothing moves you anymore. The reason is because God is trying to bring you into an educational syllabus. That now you are not of this world. You are in the world, but you are not of the world. And so people can tell you, they are playing Champions League Finals in Wembley. Okay. They are hoping you will shout. Okay. Well done. Are you not going? I've got my ticket. Goodbye. <laughs> and the person will be shocked. How come you are not moved? The problem is that I am in the world, but I'm not of the world. I've entered another frequency. The joy of the Holy Ghost begins to power you. Now, this is what David understood in the Old Testament. He said, take not thy spirit from within me. Restore unto me the joy of salvation. When Jesus brings life, it comes with joy. But after a while, you will discover that joy will become hunger for the presence. The presence of God. You hear there's a Bible study. You are there for 10 hours. You are not tired. You leave one meeting, you go to another meeting. Sometimes in one day, you are on three different prayers online. You finish one hour, you enter three hours, you come back to one hour. And they are wondering, how are you surviving? Sometimes when you finish a long service, you now go home and do a vigil. And this vigil, you are alone in your room. And you are singing. You thought you sang two songs. The next time you checked, it's 5 a.m. Ah, how come? Is the night shorter? No, the night is not shorter. You have entered another economy. It's called hunger. And you see, when you, when you enter the presence of God, it's the realm eternal. There's no time there. You know, when Moses ascended Sinai, he thought it was for a few hours. When he came down, he discovered he had been there for 40 days. What happened? You stepped out of time. Because the presence of God excludes time. The energy and the intensity there is so much that time is compressed. And so when hunger overwhelms you, your destination is the presence. This is why all of a sudden, divine things become natural to you. God is sucking you out of the earth realm. He's sucking you out. Because the traditions of men have chiseled you so deeply. The customs of men have truncated and mutilated your soul structure. And the only thing God will do is that he needs to suck you from earth and take you back to the studio of eternity where, where you were created. You know, when God said, let us make man, he wasn't in heaven. Creation is not done in creation. Creation is done outside creation. If you are already in creation, you can't create. You can only form. So when God said, let us make man, <laughs> in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 when Jesus resurrected he didn't go to heaven the Bible said he went high above all heavens that realm is what Paul called the dwelling of light he said no man can approach it the energy there will melt anything that comes close that's where God creates from and so what God did does is that when he begins to suck you through hunger He's bringing you back to the studio where you were coupled. The psalmist said, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. There is somewhere God sits and creates the spiritual DNA of a man. And so what hunger is trying to do is to suck you out. And so even though you were born into a Chelsea family, you now return from Zion and you discover the law for Chelsea is dead. Nobody counseled you. You went somewhere. It's like radiation. When they want to deal with cancer, they expose cancer to light. The radiation will kill the cell and restructure a new order of cell. That's what hunger does. And so that hunger, pursuit of God through scripture and prayer is because God is sucking you. He's sucking you. He's sucking you. And sometimes when he wants to add some flavor, he gives you angelic encounters. And so you are praying in your room. Suddenly you find out that your hand become hot. You are saying, what's the meaning of this? There's no meaning to it. God is using it to draw you to the presence. And so you will use four years to understand what is happening in your hand. Nothing is happening. It's to keep you on the altar. Because God knows your fascination. Sometimes you are praying and you open your light and you see light standing. You now say, oh, I've become a prophet. It has, it has nothing to do with title. He's sucking you. You know, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it said, according as his divine power 
has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue he said he has made us to become partakers of the divine having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust so the way god makes you to escape the corruption he knows that nobody can advise you you are so intelligent if they say A, you say B. Even when they use scripture, you are a theologian. If they explain it, you will enter Greek and enter Hebrew and counter the person talking. And so because God knows you are too wise, he will bring you before the immortals. There you can't speak because everything is bare. You know, Isaiah the prophet was so smart. What God wanted him to do was to prophesy about the Messiah. But his tongue was in error and nobody could correct him. And so he said in the year that Uzziah died. I saw the Lord and his glory filled the temple and suddenly nobody spoke he said I'm a man of unclean lips woe unto me I dwell amongst people of unclean lips how did he discover he had come into the light that knows no corruption but his hunger that takes you there it's a journey of the wooing of the spirit God woos you he sucks you into himself Without your will, he sucks you and you discover for seven months all you do is tongues. My Kaya, here Laboa, Rakado, Sanak, Natila, Fahakata, Eolele, Asuna, Mea, Karoate, Alavamada, Ariana Taya, Oaketaya. God is for me, his man. Oh, and for those of you who are warriors, you know that is where the shape you sustain in the spirit is giving you. When you find those who are warriors, they will enter the room of fire. Yes. See, prophet can enter the room of light, but warrior, warring intercessors is fire because you, when you return, you will fight. You will fight. So they will carry you through flames, immortal flames, and your tongue will be altered. The next time you come back, when you prophesy, you will judge nations. And people who are still on earth will carry doctrine and say, we are in the era of new creation. There's no cause. There's no judgment. You didn't know where the person went to. He came from a realm yonder. And in that realm, the only thing that bothers him is the jealousy of God. And so if a nation is against God, that nation will be judged. So that a way will be paved for the glory to appear because God is beauty. I wish you understood what I'm sharing. You will now guide your prayer life with all your life. Because you will know that this prayer you are praying, it may not be like this forever. What is happening to you is that God is sucking you. That's why you pray for eight hours, you are not tired. The more you pray, the stronger you become. Ask those that are not being sucked. If it's easy to pray for four hours, there is an economy around you. And when men are not aware, when that spirit is drawing them, they will say, wait, let me watch this movie. Ah, that's the wrong time to watch a movie. I want to go to this club and come back and we pray tomorrow. You are not aware that you are in a class. The class of summons. And what is happening on your inside is more ancient than you. It's more ancient. When God wants to open your eyes, sometimes when you enter your room to pray, He will show you that many days before you come, an angel is waiting for you. That angel is the one that invites you. He said, I was in the, in the eye called Patmos. And I heard a sound as of a trumpet. He said, as I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Most of those wooing of the spirit, it's not because you are wise. It's because you are being summoned. And when you are summoned, you are drawn to the presence. Because God is putting something on your inside. He's planting something. Because when the revival comes, you may need to appear as a warrior. When the revival comes, you may need to appear as a prophet. When the revival comes, you may need to appear as a giver. And the wisdom you need to get wealth is in the studio. And if you don't come long enough, you will lack wisdom in the way the days when men make money. Some of you, what you need is influence. So that when you stand, a nation will love you. They won't even know why. You youths as a quorum, they, they measure to be attained. But you came for three months. God can use you. I stand by the rod of the apostolic. I move you forward, moving to your destiny.
The first thing that the prayer that engenders dominion produces is access to the voice of God. If God is not speaking into your life, you'll be in trouble. It is by prayer that divine purposes are born. When a man who dominates by prayer is praying, one of the things that he catches from the realm is the voice of Yahweh. The reason is because dominion is into your destiny, moving to prophecy in the name of